So um, this is a joint work with some folks at Zapata, Guoming Wang, Wu Zhezhang, uh, Xu Shen Zhu, and Peter Johnson. And uh, well, uh, although we, we heard some sobering talk just a, a few minutes ago, it's more or less about the, the same problem. Uh, and uh, namely, trying to find the, the, the ground state energy of some, some Hamiltonian uh, on, on a quantum computer. Uh, and as we just heard as well, with this, this has various applications in, in, in quantum chemistry, uh, but also it's one of the fundamental problems in, in quantum computing, of course. Um, and, uh, well, again, maybe uh, the, this is, uh, again, a, a, a statement that should be reconsidered, considering the last talk. But many people uh, believe that uh, this is also, uh, like finding round state energies is still uh, a very good application of, of a quantum computer. Oh, actually, I think you might agree with this. That is not, not yeah, so no contradiction here, good. Um, and uh, exactly, and the question we're asking here is, uh, what are the minimal requirements uh, for, for actually doing this? And uh, in terms of number of, of operations you actually require on your quantum computer. And, oh, Okay, I guess I was also uh, plagued by the PowerPoint problems. Uh, but, well, what you should see here uh, is that, well, um, there are various uh, proposals uh, on how to solve uh, ground state energy estimation on, on quantum devices. And uh, they, they are either very reliable, you have a very strong performance guarantee, like uh, phase estimation. So uh, on the lower right corner, you should see phase estimation. Um, and the lower upper left corner, you have the other extreme, uh, where you have methods like uh, VQE, which are very heuristic. So they don't require you to implement very deep circuits, but there's also not really a guarantee that they'll work. Um, and here we are trying to, to find algorithms that somehow don't require you to implement a, a very high depth or maybe allow you to tune the, the depth you're willing to implement but are still reliable. And, oh, and, sorry, I was too pessimistic, yes. Uh, so now you see some beautiful uh, figures. Um, so exactly, so you want to be in that sweet spot where you actually can tune the depth and uh, um, still get, get reliable estimates. And this is motivated by this um, early fault tolerance framework. So yesterday in Samson's uh, talk, he already uh, explained a bit what this is about. So um, in principle, we, we want to be in this regime um, where we have a, a fault tolerant quantum computer, but the number of operations we can do is still more or less limited. Then we, we cannot afford to have a lot of uh, auxiliary qubits. Um, so of course we expect that this is significantly more powerful than the, the current NISC devices we have, but uh, it's, it's still not clear how to, to get the best out of, of these devices under these uh, restrictions. So uh, one thing that one is usually happy to do in this framework is to sacrifice the, the overall running time uh, by decreasing the circuit depth. So somehow you decrease the number of gates you implement, but you increase the number of samples uh, you take. And what we do in, in this work is, uh, again, uh, as we saw in the previous talk, uh, that there are three more or less relevant parameters to, to this problem. Uh, one of them is the overlap uh, you're given with, with some ground state. So your input is some state that has some overlap with the ground state. Another important uh, parameter is, is the spectral gap. And the third important parameter is the accuracy with which you want to estimate the ground state energy. Um, and uh, in, there's a trade-off between how deep are the circuits you, you can implement, and what is the overall runtime of, of such algorithms. So what we achieve uh, in this work is to get a way of, of interpolating between uh, the, let's say, Heisenberg limit uh, scaling, where, where you have to implement circuits which are, uh, have depth proportional to the inverse precision, and 
another scaling where you have uh, epsilon to the minus two scaling, but uh, the circuit depth only require uh, only um, depends on on the spectral gap. So if your your spectral gap isn't too small, somehow you can implement shallower circuits, still estimate the ground state energy, um, and at the expense of having to sample this circuit more often. Uh, and what is nice is that we can actually interpolate between these two scenarios. So given any uh, circuit depth you wish you can implement, of course you wish to implement as deep circuits as possible, but let's say you're limited in some way. So we can interpolate uh, between these two extremes and reduce the, the, the runtime of the algorithm accordingly. So um, the approach we take to, to, to getting this algorithm is very similar to uh, other works in this direction, also uh, Samson's work uh, yesterday, um, and uh, um, also there was some work by uh, Earl Campbell and others, uh, the Lee, Tong, uh, Lee paper uh, just mentioned in the last talk as well. So roughly what we do is we assume we have access to this initial state, which we assume has a decent overlap with the ground state, and uh, we run controlled time evolutions with the Hamiltonian we care about and do some simple uh, generalized uh, Hadamard tests. So we run a bunch of these circuits for different values of tau, and we take the highest value we can implement of tau as some sort of proxy for the required circuit depth. And uh, the, we then get a bunch of these samples and then post-process them on uh, a classical device and get some ground state energy uh, estimate uh, from that. Now, as I mentioned before, um, what we get is uh, a quantum algorithm that in principle only needs times or circuit depths which are proportional to the inverse uh, of the gap. Um, and the, the scaling in, in precision is then uh, polylogarithmic or uh, of, of the quantum circuits. But then the, the total time, so the number of times you have to, to run these circuits, uh, is then uh, epsilon to the minus two. But this, uh, for this statement to hold, you just need some, some lower bound on the, the spectral gap of the Hamiltonian. And if you just uh, interpolate between the, the, the true value and just uh, take this lower bound to be, to be epsilon, then as I mentioned before, you get this sort of interpolation between um, this, this limit where you have epsilon to the minus two and epsilon to the minus one uh, by picking this value of, of alpha, um, depending on the constraints imposed by your device. Now, uh, how do we do this? Um, well, essentially, we, um, one can show that this, uh, this sort of um, circuit allows you to, to access uh, somehow the, 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 the Fourier transform of, of the, the spectral measure. And uh, this was not, I mean, this has been used in, in, in various works. Uh, and what we change is how you actually use the information you gather from, from such circuits. Um, and actually what, uh, what we do is to try to evaluate the, the convolution of this, the spectral measure, so the spectral measure is just like uh, the, the if, if you could measure this initial state in the eigenbasis of the Hamiltonian, what, are, what is the, this probability distribution? So what we do is we evaluate the, the convolution of that probability distribution with uh, a Gaussian measure, uh, and then try to infer the spectrum of the, the Hamiltonian from that. And using these Hadamard circuits, you can actually evaluate the density of this convolution. Uh, and why does this give you uh, the, the, the ground state energy and the limit where the variance of this Gaussian is very small? Well, of course, if you can, if you, in, in that limit, this will just approach uh, a delta distribution. So the convolution of F with P will essentially give you P again. So in some limit, uh, this, this convolution will just be uh, an identity, and you'll just be able to estimate the, um, the probability, uh, the p directly. But uh, as expected, somehow, the, the smaller the variance of this Gaussian distribution, the more expensive it is 
to actually implement it on uh, the quantum computer. So if you only pick a very small variance, uh, actually what you observe is something like this thing in the bottom where it's, it's not clear how to extract the, the, not necessarily clear how to extract the, the smallest component from it. Um, and uh, just to compare it with, with previous works, uh, in previous works they actually convoluted uh, and evaluated the convolution of f with the, the Habicide function, so some sort of step function. And uh, then, um, if you can approximate this convolution approximately, the, the different energy levels then correspond to the jumps in this uh, um, convolution. But uh, it turns out that if you, as you need uh, a Fourier approximation of uh, the, the, the Sabicide uh, distribution, which is not smooth, there are some, uh, this sort of approach uh, really requires you to go to depths which are proportional to the precision, uh, even, um, even if you have some promise on, on the spectral gap. So uh, what, what we then changed is how uh, which function we choose here to, to filter the um, ground state energy. Now, um, the, the first naive approach is to say, well, hopefully if we pick the, the uh, variance of this, or actually the standard deviation of this Gaussian distribution, to be at least uh, uh, proportional to the spectral gap, then what will happen is that this first peak, which corresponds to the ground state energy uh, over here, will be separated from the rest. And as the Gaussian has this nice exponential decay, if we can then evaluate this function over here, we'll see that the, the ground state will be like the first peak of this distribution. So if we can actually evaluate this thing, we can then just try to find the peak, and we're done. But it turns out that this is not a, a very good idea because, uh, well, as this, the peak corresponds to a maximum, uh, the, the, if you go uh, a little bit around it, the function won't change much. So unfortunately, uh, if, if you do this first, I implement this first idea, then the sample complexity is actually quadratic and epsilon and the spectral gap, which is not great. Uh, so you need something that is a bit, uh, that changes a bit faster around this peak. So uh, what we then do is just to evaluate instead the, the convolution um, of uh, this P with the derivative of a Gaussian function. And then of course the peaks become zeros of this, this convolution. Um, and this, this decays faster around, around the zeros. So you can actually identify where the ground state is with, with a smaller um, precision. So uh, in fact, if you then evaluate things with the, the derivative of, of the Gaussian function, then you get the, the result um, I claimed before. Now, just uh, again, what is, how do we actually evaluate this, this um, convolution? Well, again, you just use these, these Hadamar tests, uh, and all you need to do is really to somehow truncate uh, the Fourier uh, expansion of, uh, sorry, the, the Fourier transform of, of this Gaussian distribution. And this is a very simple thing to do. The analysis is, is quite elementary, because this will, again, uh, be, be a Gaussian, right? And uh, the only thing you need to do in the, in the quantum device is to pick the, the, the times uh, you evaluate this. So you just do Monte Carlo on the quantum device to estimate uh, this expression on the right. And then this way, uh, you can evaluate this, this convolution at various points um, on the real line, find where, where this peak is. And um, from this, you actually found your um, ground state energy. And at least for, uh, uh, we, we performed some numerics, and for, for these molecules, we see that uh, um, using our work, our approach based on this, this spectral gap, 
you can reduce the number of, of gates you require to estimate the ground state energy to uh, by like uh, 43 or 78. So uh, this, this gives you um, some important reductions on, on the number of gates you need to, to implement to actually um, estimate this, this ground state energy. And um, like I, I reserved a bit of time for the conclusion, because actually, um, as you saw, we have now a, a quantum algorithm that can somehow interpolate between uh, these two regimes of like this Heisenberg scaling and the, the spectral gap scaling. Um, and uh, however, to, uh, there are some aspects of this algorithm that are not that satisfactory. So first of all, there is this quadratic scaling with the overlap you would actually want. I mean, we know that in principle, you could get a scaling that is only uh, inverse proportional to, to this overlap. Um, so that's, that's something that is uh, like not ideal or let's say not optimal about our proposal. And another thing that is maybe um, not ideal is that you need a lower bound on the spectral gap to be able to to get uh, a bit out of, uh, I mean, to, to get better uh, circuit depths, right? If you don't know anything about the spectral gap, then in principle, you, you also don't know what is the smallest depth you need to implement. Uh, and tomorrow, we're also putting a, a paper on the archive where we address these two issues. So uh, in principle, we, we get a new curve. I think we have exactly the same plot in this new paper where uh, we get a new curve over here where um, we also get the similar scaling, but now with a eta to the minus one uh, scaling on the overlap. And uh, we have a way of also certifying that the, the ground state energy you, you produced, uh, the estimate you produced is correct, even if you don't know what the, the spectral gap is. So you could just run uh, circuits that are not exactly the ones like we showed here, but also not too different, um, and then use the estimates you obtain to, to also test whether the spectral, uh, whether the estimate is correct, even if you don't know uh, the, the spectral gap. Uh, unfortunately, this also comes with uh, a higher uh, dependency on, on epsilon if you want to perform this test to make sure you have the right um, energy estimate, even if you don't know the spectral gap. So yeah, please. Uh, if you're interested, take a look tomorrow on the archive or just uh, uh, approach me today. Um, and uh, finally, I think there's also another interesting problem, which is um, how do we actually estimate the, the ground state energy if the uh, maximum circuit depth we allow ourselves is even smaller than uh, the, the spectral gap of, of the system? And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Daniel Stilk Franca, for the very interesting talk. Are there any questions? Really nice talk. Uh, I want to know why we use uh, Hadamard test. In, like oh uh, well, the so the this 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 sort of circuit like here uh, allows you to um, estimate expectation values of this form, and these quantities over here are exactly what pops up. In, in this integral over here, but then weighted by this um, function. So somehow what, what our goal is, is to evaluate this, this convolution. And uh, with access to the, the quantum computer and circuits like this, we can uh, estimate the, the, these terms in the integral uh, weighted by this, I mean, this thing we can evaluate classically. So we can just do uh, Monte Carlo to evaluate this integral if we um, are given access to circuits like this because 
they give us access to like a random variable which has this expectation value. All right. Does that make sense? So actually, the, the, the edge in the below is a Hamiltonian that you, it's not like Hadamard gates, right? Like yeah, 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 no, so this is a, a Hadamard gate, Hadamard gate, this is a, like a face and, uh, or inverse, and um, right, this is the controlled uh, Hamiltonian evolution, okay. and this age, the, let's say this age over here is not a Hadamard, it's the Hamiltonian of the problem you care about, yeah. Thanks, uh, very interesting. Thanks. <clears throat> Thanks, Daniel. So um, I find this idea intriguing of using the derivative of the Gaussian as the mm -hmm. filter function instead of something that's more Gaussian-like. Um, but I think I kind of, and, and, and also the idea of trying to get a depth that's independent of epsilon. But I feel like I missed in the talk how that was connected to getting a depth that was, like you had this slide where you talked about the standard deviation of the... Mm -hmm. so um, this one, or you this yeah. one? Well, okay, so on this slide, you had the sigma at the bottom left, and it had a dependence on epsilon. Mm -hmm. And I was expecting you to say, oh, but then when we change to a different filter function, the epsilon disappears. But then it looked oh. like it was still there. So I don't, I don't know which step in the proof the epsilon disappears. Oh, uh, I misread the next slide. Or maybe, maybe what is happening is that we are um, hiding the epsilons in the old tildes. So the, the circuit depth still depends on, on epsilon, but does so uh, polylogarithmically. Okay, okay. Yeah, so um, essentially the, what happens is that, you know, you have, uh, you have to evaluate the convolution with functions of, of this form, which are these Gaussian derivatives. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, because of this uh, exponential scaling over here, you just, uh, sorry, maybe I can be a bit more precise. So if you, um, the, how, in principle, we want to evaluate this convolution, right? Uh, and if you want to do it exactly, you have to go, I mean, to arbitrarily large times. Where we truncate this integral is directly related to how, how long we have to evolve. Um, but uh, if we want to achieve a precision epsilon on evaluating this thing, at least in principle, if you knew the expectation values exactly, um, then for the Gaussian, you only have to pick T the, uh, logarithmic in in epsilon because the 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 Gaussian has this logarithmically decay I mean exponentially decaying tail. Does that make more sense? I think I need to read the paper. Right. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for trying. Are there any more questions? I just wonder if you can comment on <coughs> this approach and the approach by AlphaWiki, because there's a similarity in that you both have this continuous extrapolation from one of epsilon to the Heisenberg limit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's it's very much uh, similar in 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 spirit. I mean, they they also let's say the the the, the I think the 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 method itself is is different, but uh, the, the result you get out is very similar that both both of these approaches, um, again, like for, for slightly different problems have this, this interpolation between like a fully coherent thing where you get epsilon to the minus one scaling with a smaller depth with epsilon to the minus two. So it's very much similar in, in spirit, I would say. We still have loads of time. Uh, so maybe I'll ask a question. At one point, you compare to uh, Lin and Tong's mm -hmm. um, approach in terms of I think you had gate depth and count or something. You had a you had a chart. Mm -hmm. um, oh, oh yeah, okay. This thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, was this taking into account the constant factors of both your algorithm and of Lin and Tong's, and you compared like the the times that you need for the for the Hamiltonian simulation? Yes. Uh, so first of all, I should say that I was not involved in doing uh, these numerics. So take everything I'm going to say now with a grain of salt. Uh, but 
if uh, unless um, misquoting my, my colleagues, I think what they did was exactly to extract also the, the constants required for, for the algorithms and uh, also looked at how how good these constants are doing some numerics uh, and uh, plugged in all these uh, different values for the uh, for the two algorithms. So they really, you know, estimate did some resource estimation for for both algorithms. Right. So, well, um, given that you already have the standard constant factors when you do these numerical simulations, I wonder if you've compared to like other approaches for ground state energy estimation. Because mm -hmm. in in your algorithm, like the um, time evolution, the control mm -hmm. time evolution, mm -hmm. is you're assumed you just have access to it. Um, mm -hmm. But if you were to instantiate it by, let's say, like trotterization or cubicization, mm -hmm. um, it would have these other overheads. And I'm wondering, like, since you have a larger total number of circuits because you've reduced circuit depth, mm -hmm. if you compare the resource estimates for your algorithm versus something like directly doing phase estimation on the watt operator mm -hmm. instead of doing like quantum signal processing to, to get the time evolution, how that would compare. Right. So yeah, I guess I guess then it it depends on like how uh, what's the input model for like your your Hamiltonian, right? Um, what um, what is the limiting factor? Because for instance, for us, we only need one additional um, qubit, right? And then if you use strutterization, in principle, you could uh, implement these time evolutions with a very small number of additional qubits, but Again, with a larger overhead and precision, if you had a um, block encoding, I guess you would need more qubits, but then a lower overhead and the precision. Um, I think it's it's very difficult to give a, a, a definite answer to, to to that question. I think uh, it depends highly on on like how many qubits you're willing to to extra qubits you're willing to spend, and also. What is the, the let's say the most natural input model to the for this for this Hamiltonian simulation? Right, it'd be an interesting comparison. Yes, especially if you already yeah. have the numbers. Our our referees also think so. Yes, yeah, so we're working <laughs> on that. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Oh, uh, well, actually, first I, I I was going to make a comment, but I actually. First, I want to ask you to repeat something you said at the end. So at the very, very end, you said it's also an interesting question to consider something, something limit when something is smaller than something. Can you, can you just repeat oh, what yes. that was? Yes, and then so, I, I had a comment on it. Right. So the, I think that's, let's say, it's not, uh, let's say, terribly surprising that you can do ground state energy estimation with circuits uh, that have a depth that scales with the spectral gap. But uh, can you also do it with, let's say, if you only have circuits of uh, depth like square root of, of spectral gap, like, uh, uh, or, or something like this, or maybe like constant, like what is the trade-off between, because so we, we see how we can access this bit of, of the curve, right? But I think that this bit of the curve is still mostly unexplored. Uh, we, of course, expect this thing to explode as we reduce the, the circuit depth. Otherwise, there's, we could just simulate these circuits classically, right, if they're very shallow in principle. Um, but the question is, how, how does the scaling look like on this side of, of the curve? Because I think nothing rigorous is known there. Um, does that make so, sense? So do, so do um, okay, so, uh, I mean, many systems have no gap, so uh, what happens to all these? Oh, so if your system has, is, is gapless, uh, so let's say uh, maybe, um, so by gapless you mean like an exponentially closing uh, gap or, or? Oh, okay, so that's, you can still tolerate poly, uh, algebraically closing gaps. Algebraically closing gaps, they're fine, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so, so I was just want, oh, sorry. Continue. So really my question was, can you take advantage of the fact that in many systems, I mean, the, the states above the gap really have no um, physical difference to the states below the gap? Like, like, in the, like in the metal, you have an algebraically closing gap. 
doesn't matter if you create a small excitation because essentially the energy is distributed across the across everything and it is really in the same phase. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that so this dependence on this actual gap is not physically relevant in even these cases of small gap systems in mm -hmm. the generic case? Mm -hmm. Some way to take advantage of that. Yes. So um, I think that somehow if you if you can find a way of, of filtering out the these these um, low level excitations, then uh, you could take advantage of this in our algorithm. And then instead of having, let's say, this this true gap here, you would have some sort of effective gap. Which uh, so as long as you 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 can make sure to to either filter out those low lying excitations or uh, that you're given the promise that actually you have like spectral gap, and then um, let's say you have some sort of uh, no, not, not, don't want to say gap again. So you, you, you have some spacing between the rest of the spectrum in your initial state. Then indeed you can use this information to still get the, the, the ground state energy uh, with even lower circuit depths. Yes. Okay, well let's see the wheel again. Okay. 